Basal nucleus, formerly known as basal ganglia. We've changed the way that we name things uh, based on if it's the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. So the way that we used to talk about this structure is that it was called the basal ganglia. We know that it's in the central nervous system. So cell bodies that are in the central nervous system, we denote that by using the term nucleus. Cell bodies that are in the peripheral nervous system, we denote that by using the word ganglia. One of the easy ways to remember that is the dorsal root ganglion. So that always kind of reminds us that, oh, okay, that is peripheral. Uh, so we use ganglia for peripheral and then nucleus uh, is going to be saved for our central nervous system cell bodies. So uh, these, are, these terms are one and the same. You'll see us talk about ganglia, uh, basal ganglia and basal nucleus. Don't think that they're two different structures. This just uh, happens to be a tough one for most of us to switch over to solely using the words uh, basal nucleus. So let's go ahead and get started. The basal nuclei major nuclei, according to Nolte on page 477, are the caudate, putamen, nucleus accumbens, globus pallidus, substantia nigra, and subthalamic nucleus. The picture to the right, you won't see the substantia nigra or the subthalamic nucleus. I have other pictures later in your PowerPoint presentation to show you where those are. I numbered these so we can keep track of them. So this is the basics of the basal nu nuclei here. And then later into your PowerPoint, we're gonna go point by point here. So you'll see the caudate show up and that'll be numbered in the slides. And then number two for putamen, three for nucleus accumbens, so on and so forth. But this is the basic uh, concept here of what structures that we're talking about. And then uh, the next slide will be a picture so you can uh, pause the next slide and go back and forth in between this one. This is going to be filled out for you and then the next slide is going to be blank. So again, you're not going to see substantia nigra and subthalamic nuclei on this picture, but check out all of the other things on here. We can see uh, at the upper left hand corner uh, starting off, I'll take my red marker so you can see where I'm at, the head of the caudate nucleus here. So what we're looking at is this right here, the head of the caudate nucleus. And then down here, if you look down here, that's the tail of the caudate nucleus. So please note the lateral ventricles, the space here, I'm in yellow now, right by those structures that we were just at. So the ventricles, and then up top and to the right, you could see where it's labeling the ventricle here as well in yellow, this space there. So what you're looking at would be like a C shape. And then you're cutting through. So if you were to make a C shape with your hand right now, and then you were to only see the fingertips and then a little bit of uh, the base palm of your hand, then uh, you wouldn't actually see the whole rest of that C shape. That's what we're looking at here. So make sure that you understand uh, this slide here. And we'll look at this a little bit more and it'll make a little bit more sense uh, as we go through. So take a little time, pause the next slide. Let's look at that. And you can uh, start to label the structures here. And here it is as a blank one that you can fill out. So. Take your time, pause, go back and forth between the previous slide and this slide, and really practice the structures here. So it helps to kind of normalize the words when we write them out. So take your time and work on this, and I'll see you on the next slide. So go ahead and pause and take your time, please. This is a nice little chart here to kind of keep things uh, straight in your mind's eye here. So. Uh, a couple things um, that show up as very, very common test questions on your boards. I always ask these questions because I try and emulate what you'll see on the boards for uh, Nero. So if we look over here, let's look at this uh, corpus striatum or just the striatum is fine. That's the caudate nucleus and the putamen. So we saw that in an earlier slide. This is a derivative of the telencephalon. So remember our tel, di, mesmet, my. So this is gonna be telencephalon. So chapter two stuff, remember. And then lentiform nucleus, notice that it's pink and green. So lentiform nucleus is going to be the putamen. 
and the globus pallidus. So it's going to be uh, putamen is telencephalon, globus pallidus is diencephalon. Together, they're called the lentiform nucleus. Somebody thought that they looked like lentils, so that's where the lentiform nucleus comes from. Basal nucleus functions to regulate movement. It's going to inhibit inappropriate involuntary movements. So the basics is that it's going to control involuntary movement, but in effect, indirectly, it would then affect uh, voluntary movements as well. So it's going to help us with the learning of fine motor skills. Interestingly, dysfunction does not lead to paralysis, it's going to lead to abnormal motor control. So we're not able to control those involuntary movements. So we see this as uh, tremors, chorea or Huntington's chorea. See the word uh, choreography from uh, chorea there. So it's this dance, the dance of Huntington's. Athetosis, myoclonus, tic, dystonia. These are all abnormal movements. So some sort of dyskinesia or a dysfunctional movement. So we're going to see alterations in muscle tone as well when there are basal nucleus dysfunctions. Collectively, it's going to modulate the output of the frontal cortex. So think about what's going on uh, with the central sulcus and then the precentral gyrus and what's happening in front of there that's for motor, remember. So this is for fine motor uh, control and regulating movement. So damage here is, has traditionally been considered to cause disorders characterized by those involuntary movements, difficulty initiating movements. Again, we'll see this uh, at the end with some Parkinsonism examples. However, damage to certain parts of the basal ganglia or basal nucleus can cause disturbances of cognition and motivation instead as well. So thinking about what's going on in that frontal uh, area of the brain, the frontal cortex, frontal lobe, pre-central area. So the idea of cognition being kind of thinking, right, and then motivation. The way that I like to think of the basal nucleus is uh, this dog on a leash. Okay, so the basal nucleus would be the leash. It's not instigating movement. Basal nucleus doesn't instigate or create the movement. It controls the movement. So with if if the dog isn't on the leash, right, if the basal nucleus isn't working appropriately, the dog here would be all over the place. So it's not a well-trained dog, right? So that leash is controlling the movements of the dog. So it fine-tunes movements by inhibition, inhibits unwanted or competing movements. So basal nucleus, remember when we had our pyramidal tracts? So we just went through uh, chapter 18 and there was a tract supplement uh, after that. So our pyramidal tracts, remember, were the corticospinal tract and the cortical bulbar tract. So motor movement, right? Uh, so the extra pyramidal would be everything else. So basal nucleus is considered extra pyramidal. So it's not pyramidal is basically all that's saying. And pyramidal is corticospinal and cortical bulbar. So uh, that's all that means. Okay, so what's the shark doing here? So uh, primitive animals like sharks and birds, they do not have a cerebral motor co cortex. They only have the basal nucleus for movement. So their movements are crude, right? So the shark uh, can't do uh, fine motor movements like a ballerina dancer can because of their basal nucleus and they have this fine control over their movements, right? Uh, but birds and sharks, they don't really need that. So uh, the shark can get around just fine in the water, the birds can get around just fine in the air uh, with just their basal nucleus. So the cerebral cortex pyramidal system gives us that higher skilled purposeful movements, especially of our hands. So the older, cruder system is the basal nucleus. The newer system would be that cerebral cortex. That was our overview of the basics for the basal nuclei. I put this slide back up here so we could go through the specifics. So we're going to go through caudate putamen, nucleus cumbens, globus pallidus, substantia nigra, and subthalamic nucleus. So let's start with number one, the caudate. The picture to the right has the caudate nucleus. The head is that green arrow is pointing to the head, that thicker area on the left, then the body and the thinner tail. It's 
all nestled into that concave wall of the lateral ventricle and follows it along its entire length down to the temporal lobe. Located on the concave side of the caudate is the putamen. And then the small globus pallidus is gonna lie hidden medially to the putamen. And we don't see it on this picture here. We'll see it in other pictures along the way in this PowerPoint. We also can't see the thalamus. It's also hidden by the putamen, but it's in this area as well. Although thalamus is not a basal nucleus, but it's located right in this area. So they lie at the base of the telencephalon at the border with the diencephalon. So in the in both horizontal and coronal sections with this sectional plane where we would see the caudate nucleus, the head and the tail. So if you're looking here at these green arrows, I'll take my green marker to kind of point them out. And then you were to cut along here as the picture is noting this red line here, you would see this part of the caudate and you would see this part of the caudate in a, a section and you'd go why is there a head over here and a tail over here but nothing in between it's because we're we have this big c shape back here that wasn't seen as part of the specimen so another view here of caudate caudate nucleus so you can see the lateral ventricles here let me write on that for you okay so this blue space here, these lateral ventricles. See how it's kind of nestled in there? And so when you slice across here, remember, you'd see the head of the caudate here, okay? and you'd see the tail here. So that's why it's confusing on some slices, remember. Okay, so tail running posteriorly into the atrium and then anteriorly into that inferior horn. Uh, we see prefrontal and other association areas of the cortex. So this is going to have cognitive function uh, and less directly involved in movement. So basal nucleus, we think of movement, control of movement, inhibition of unwanted movements. Uh, caudate specifically, we're going to see more cognitive function uh, associations here. This slide is here for you to practice on. So using the previous slide, to identify the structures, go ahead and pause and label the thalamus, the caudate nucleus, the lateral ventricle, and the putamen. You'll see a lot of times that caudate and caudate nucleus are kind of used interchangeably. You can call it either. So go ahead and pause, check this out, and then come on back. Number two on our list is the putamen. The part of the striatum involved most prominently in the motor functions of the basal ganglia, basal nucleus, the putamen receives afferents from the cerebral cortex. So afferents we usually associate with sensory, but afferents really is just the information coming in. So the information coming into the putamen from the cerebral cortex here is going to be primarily motor and somatosensory information. Uh, and it's also going to get information from the substantia nigra, the compact part, and the central median nucleus of the thalamus. It projects efferents to the globus pallidus, which in turn projects via the thalamus. So it's going to go through that VA and VL of the thalamus, those two, the VA-VL uh, nuclei of the thalamus, to premotor and supplementary motor areas. The putamen forms the outer component of the lenticular nucleus. Globus pallidus is going to be the inner part. So putamen is going to be more external. Globus pallidus is going to be more internal or medial in relationship. There's a chart or a little diagram there to the right from your Nolte book. So it's talking about the different kind of subcategories of the basal ganglia. If you look, the striatum, uh, sometimes we refer to the caudate, the nucleus accumbens, and putamen as the striatum. And then we're also going to call the lenticular nucleus the putamen and the globus pallidus. So when we put putamen and globus pallidus together, 
we can call that the lenticular nucleus. Okay, so we saw that uh, earlier in the diencephalon telencephalon slide. And then uh, the other parts of the basal ganglia here, subthalamic nucleus, substantia nigra. Just wanted to remind you that putamen plus globus pallidus is the lenticular nucleus. There's also information that the putamen has connections to from the frontal eye fields, prefrontal area, parietal association cortex. So one of the ideas here is uh, that prefrontal uh, area, that frontal eye field. So frontal eye field is area eight of our Brodmann's areas and frontal eye field neurons interconnect extensively with other known structures of the saccadic system, so eye movements. Okay? So frontal eye fields have topographic projections directly to the intermediate layers of the ipsilateral superior colliculus, so same side superior colliculus. Remember that superior colliculus is the visual reflex. You see something out of the corner of your eye and you turn and you look. So these have uh, connections to that ipsilateral superior colliculus, so particularly into neurons exhibiting saccadic related activity. Frontal eye fields also are going to project into the ipsilateral caudate and putamen, to the cerebellum via the pontine nuclei and to many oculomotor associated nuclei in the midbrain and pons, including the brainstem saccadic generator. So the idea here is uh, over and over and over again in neurology, we look at the eyes and we test eye movement and see if there are any issues and you'll be hard pressed to find um, any neurological dysfunction that doesn't have some sort of eye movement disorder associated with it or some sort of connection. That's why we just do eye movements for any neurological disorder. Even if we can't figure out what the problem is, we know that eye movements are probably gonna help. So let's take a look at that superior colliculus connection. So the putamen inhibits the substantia nigra. This inhibits the inhibition that the substantia nigra has over the superior colliculus. So inhibits inhibition. This allows the superior colliculus to facilitate eye saccadic movements. So it comes from the frontal eye field to the caudate then to the putamen. The nucleus accumbens is the most inferior part of the striatum with predominantly limbic connections and it plays a role in reward and addiction. The mesolimbic pathway, so this kind of middle limbic area, so we're looking here at the prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens uh, in that uh, ventral tegmental area of uh, the brain there, involved in the reward pathway of the brain. So nucleus accumbens shows dopamine release in response to rewarding stimuli. So this is where uh, I associate that with addiction. So I like to do a little bit of word association uh, as my study technique. So when I hear these different terms, I have kind of a filing system. So A for accumbens, A for addiction. And then we understand that addiction comes from this dopamine drive. So it's more of the drive and the actual reward is what we are finding out uh, in the literature. So it's kind of a fascinating um, sub area to study. And there are chiropractors that work solely with uh, patients in uh, crisis in addiction and in addiction recovery. So uh, if that's of interest to you, that is a subdivision that you can uh, undertake as a chiropractor. The claustrum is a thin but extensive layer of gray matter beneath the insula, separated from it and the underlying putamen by the extreme and external capsules. The claustrum has reciprocal connections with the cerebral cortex, but incompletely understood functions. I went on to look up the claustrum in PubMed uh, to get a little bit better understanding than that little definition that we got from Nolte there. So what is the function of the claustrum? 
and uh, the article is cited at the bottom of this page is, uh, of, of, if this is of interest to you. So uh, claustrum means hidden away. And this article talks about how the claustrum is where it all comes together and consciousness occurs. So I thought this was kind of an interesting thing to kind of read up about. So I'll read you an excerpt here from the article. The claustrum is a thin, irregular, sheet-like neuronal structure hidden beneath an inner surface of the neocortex in the general region of the insula. Its function is enigmatic. Its anatomy is quite remarkable in that it receives input from almost all regions of the cortex and projects back to almost all regions of the cortex. We here briefly summarize what is known about the claustrum, speculate on its possible relationship to the processes that give rise to integrated conscious perceptions, propose mechanisms that enable information to travel widely within the claustrum and then discuss experiments to address these questions. So that's an excerpt from the paper. I found that paper fascinating. If you want to learn more about that, that paper is cited for you there. And uh, that ends up uh, of the paper doesn't show up on my exams, but I think it's pretty interesting if they start talking about where uh, everything kind of comes together and where consciousness occurs. So that's there for you. The striatum is an inclusive term for the caudate nucleus, putamen, and ventral striatum. The striatum is a major point of entry into the basal nucleus circuitry, receiving inputs from most or all cortical areas and projecting inhibitory outputs to the globus pallidus and substantia nigra, specifically the reticular part. The ventral striatum is primarily limbic, so it's a limbic subdivision of the, sub, of the striatum comprising of the nucleus accumbens, adjacent parts of the caudate nucleus, and putamen in basal forebrain. Globus pallidus is this wedge-shaped nucleus medial to the putamen that gives rise to most of the efferents from the basal ganglia. In this picture here, you can see the globus pallidus external and internal. You can see it off to uh, the wording is to the left. Starting at the top there, you can see the caudate nucleus, which is kind of peeking out from that lateral ventricle. You can see the lateral medullary lamina, that uh, just that little stripe in there separating structures. We see globus pallidus external and internal. We see the amygdala. At the bottom center area, you could see the mammillary bodies. Coming over to the right, note the lateral fissure. You could see the fornix in the center, the claustrum, that little strip of gray matter there, and the hippocampus. Globus pallidus has an internal and an external segment. The internal Afferents or sensory is going to come from the striatum and the subthalamic nucleus. Efferents are going to go out via the ansa lenticularis and the lenticular fasciculus or tracts to the thalamus. Globus pallidus external, afferents or sensory coming in from the striatum and subthalamic nucleus, just like the internal. But our efferents are going to be going out via the subthalamic fasciculus to the subthalamic nucleus. The lentiform nucleus is a combination of the putamen and the globus pallidus, internus and externus. There's a small strip of lamina separating the putamen from the globus pallidus. There's also a small strip of lamina that separates the globus pallidus external and internal. Sometimes you'll just see it called GPI and GPE. Okay? So globus pallidus interna has a natural inhibition of the thalamus. Now remember, most things with the basal nucleus are going to kind of default into understanding that it's an inhibition. 
uh, when we get a little bit further into our uh, PowerPoint here, we'll talk a little bit more about the function uh, as well. But just this idea that globus uh, internal has inhibition, I for I there. The substantia nigra is a large nucleus in the midbrain interposed between the red nucleus and cerebral peduncle. The substantia nigra has two parts, a compact part and a reticular part. The compact part containing closely packed pigmented dopaminergic neurons that project to the striatum. So they're pigmented with what we call neuromelanin. Melanin, you'll probably recognize that as uh, what makes skin color dark, but we also have another use for it here. So we call it neuromelanin. So we have the compact part. We also have a reticular part, which contains more loosely arranged neurons, receiving inputs from the striatum and projecting to the thalamus. An important aspect of the substantia nigra to remember is that it is vital in the role of producing dopamine, and that is a salient feature of Parkinson's disease to have a reduced substantia nigra or a pale substantia nigra is a hallmark of Parkinson's disease. Subthalamic nucleus is a lens-shaped biconvex mass of gray matter just medial and superior to the junction of the internal capsule and cerebral peduncle. The subthalamic nucleus is the basis of the indirect route through the basal ganglia. Subthalamic nucleus is going to have excitatory projections from this subthalamic nucleus to the globus pallidus. Interestingly, all the outputs from the striatum, globus pallidus, reticular part of the substantia nigra, are inhibitory, and they use GABA as a neurotransmitter. The only prominent source of excitatory or glutamate projections is the subthalamic nucleus. And talking about the subthalamic nucleus here, we'll see some hyperkinetic movement disorders, uh, result from a destruction of the striatum or subthalamic nucleus. So we see decreases in the inhibition of the thalamus and uh, excess excitation of the motor cortex. Hemibolismus comes from the Greek word meaning jumping about. So bolismus, jumping about, hemi meaning half. So it's one of the most dramatic disorders of the basal nuclei. Its most prominent characteristic is a wild flailing movement of one arm and leg. The responsible lesion is usually the contralateral subthalamic nucleus. Hemibolismus is most often seen in older people caused by a stroke involving a small ganglionic branch of the PCA or posterior cerebral artery. So here's an example of a video of a hyperkinetic movement disorder, so hemibolismus. And she's young, she, um, her and her friend uh, seem to have a bit of a sense of humor about it. Uh, it even looks like she can almost control it when she points her finger to conduct the orchestra. Um, but as you can tell, she's really struggling um, with this movement. So we'll see it. We'll see the video play on the next slide. Couldn't get it to play on the same same time as talking over it. Here's a paper at the bottom here that helps to explain some hyperkinetic movement uh, disorders a little bit more if that's of interest to you. Otherwise, uh, the next slide, you'll see uh, the video play. If it's not working for you, the YouTube is right there and you can check that out as well.
So let's talk a little bit about what's happening there with that patient's arm, right? So she's getting this go, no-go signal, and, and we all get this go, no-go signal, and we, we use those terms. They're pretty simple sounding, right? Go, no-go. Uh, we use those terms um, in, in neuro for this direct and indirect pathway. So the direct pathway means go, right? So uh, we're going to move. This is where it gets tricky. It's going to inhibit disinhibition. Sounds like a double negative, right? Uh, of globus pallidus internus on the thalamus. <clears throat> the result here, what you have to remember, is that it's increased cortical stimulation. That's why I put it all in green here for you. Okay, go. Direct pathway. Indirect. Note the N there in red. I put that there to help you remember that's no-go. Indirect. A decreased cortical stimulation is the result. So we'll see the globus pallidus externus uh, creating an inhibitory response. And we'll see this hopefully make a little bit more sense in the next slide. Okay, so direct or go or movement. Okay, and then our indirect or our no-go or not moving. So you can see in green there that's the go pathway. Okay, how do we move? And then the red is going to tell us when not to move. Okay, so if you want, we could start here at that neostriatum in this go pathway. Let me grab my marker here. Okay, so neostriatum to globus pallidus internus or GPI. And then to the thalamus. And then thalamus is going to stimulate cortex to move, to tell us to move. Cortex isn't going to move, but to make us move our muscles in a coordinated effort. No-go, or indirect pathway, or that control of movement, goes neostriatum to globus pallidus externus. So note here, this is internal, it's staying inside. See how this is in, in our circle here, it's internal. External is going to the outside here. And then subthalamic nuclei, so underneath the thalamus. Thalamus is up here, subthalamic means under the thalamus, so it's over here. So we're out, we're down, and then we're going to inhibit via this pathway. So we're just adding these two things in here. Okay, so these two things is all that we're adding. So first, if you were going to memorize this, memorize go first, right? This pathway here. Once you have that down, it's just four things. Once you have that down, go external and under and then back up. And that's inhibiting. Basal nucleus damage. So one of the things we want to remember about basal nucleus damage is that uh, traditionally we know that it causes movement disorders, but we also want to think about the cognition and motivation uh, problems that it can cause as well. So in your patients, you'll see movement disorders, but uh, don't underestimate the uh, subtleties of personality changes. Uh, thought process changes, impulse control changes, uh, motivation changes, so we're not dealing with a uh, completely intact uh, cognitive thought process in that patient as well. So we want to be mindful when we're treating that patient uh, and uh, educating their family as well that it's part of the disease process. Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism is probably the most common uh, basal nucleus disorder that we're going to see in practice. It's going to be the most uh, commonly thought of uh, one according to the public for sure. There's a slide here I included that says Parkinson's disease. It is uh, now known more as Parkinsonism, so we're kind of getting away from calling it Parkinson's disease, and you'll hear it called uh, Parkinsonism a little bit more, um, just a change in vocabulary. What is it? It's a progressive degeneration of the substantia nigra, so that black substance that we saw in the brain. So we're going to see a loss of dopamine. So remember, it is going to be melanocyte-stimulating hormone 
uh, involved in the production of dopamine and melanin is either going to be the kind of end product, the ash that's kind of left over uh, in that substantia nigra, or it's part of the purpose of it. Not quite sure on that. So we don't really have that much literature on uh, if it is the ash that's left over uh, in this analogy, or if it's the fire, the purpose of it, right? Is, is it the purpose or is it just what's left over? We don't really know. Uh, but we're going to see a loss of dopamine and uh, we're going to see a pale substantia nigra and those are the hallmarks of parkinsonism we're going to see a decreased nigrostriatal pathway unable to amplify that direct pathway that go so remember that stop and go game with the red light green light right so what did that look like that's going to look a lot like parkinsonism trying to move we'll see a loss of fine control in the indirect pathway as well We'll see inclusion bodies or Louis bodies. Again, we're getting away from uh, calling things by people's proper names, but you'll see them kind of interchanged right now. So uh, there's a picture of, of the Louis bodies there for you. You can see this kind of protein buildup in the neuron uh, and causes problems in um, that kind of complete message getting across. Classic signs and symptoms of Parkinsonism is going to be, if you look to the picture to the right, this elderly gentleman, it's going to affect men more than women. Uh, we're going to see this kind of pill rolling tremor, so see his hands are kind of moving. You'll see that term in your test questions. It'll say pill rolling tremor, P for pill, P for Parkinsonism uh, is how I remembered that one, and that's going to be a resting tremor which is different than an intention tremor. Intention tremor is associated with multiple sclerosis. So resting, pill rolling tremor, Parkinsonism. We're gonna see a video in, in a few minutes here on what that looks like. Uh, this forward tilt of the trunk, you're gonna see that forward head posture, stooped posture, uh, rigidity, flexed elbows and wrists. Imagine what you could do for this person with a nice gentle adjustment uh, and activating some of the extensors of the body that would feel really good and get uh, hopefully at least some temporary relief into this patient. Uh, masked facial expression, you might see it called masked faces as well, F-A-C-I-E-S, so don't let that trip you up. Uh, so it's really just um, a lack of expression on the face. If you look over to the left, this is uh, showing us the central nervous system. You can see depression, anxiety, decline in intellectual functioning, dizziness, or fainting. You can see that it's, it can affect the lungs, upper airway obstruction, abnormal, abnormalities in uh, ventilator, ventilation control. Look at that stooped posture. Go into a stooped posture like that and then see how deep of a breath you can take. How well is that diaphragm uh, allowing uh, movement down and opening up that negative pressure breathing system? Not very well in that position. Muscular, we'll see weakness and aches, which is kind of tough to tell because this is, you know, common in elderly people, but it's also a feature of Parkinsonism. Intestines, you'll see constipation. Again, hard to tell with uh, the elderly. A lot of times there's uh, irritable bowel issues with the elderly. Eyes, a forced closure of the eyelids, like a blepharous spasm, so blepher being eyelid. Mouth, difficulty speaking, excessive salivation, difficulty in swallowing, a soft, low voice. Skin, they might have an increase in sweating. Systematically, we'll see the tremor, the slowness, impaired balance, small, real jagged handwriting. If you see somebody with handwriting kind of all over the place, uh, you want to check out their hands and see if they have some sort of tremor. Sleepiness, trouble moving or walking, and then the masked face of Parkinsonism. Muhammad Ali is a famous boxer uh, known to have had Parkinson's disease. He was diagnosed in 1984, three years after his retirement from boxing. Uh, he would survive the disease for another 32 years, amounting to almost half his life. He passed away from complications of Parkinson's disease in 2016 at the age of 74. So he lived a, a pretty long time with that. So um, sometimes people are going to die a little bit sooner than that, but not necessarily a death sentence with Parkinson's disease.
Pugilistic Parkinson's disease is specifically a Parkinson's disease associated with boxers. That's the pugilistic part uh, telling us that it is a boxer. So conditions seen especially in boxers caused by repeated cerebral concussions and characterized by weakness in the lower limbs, unsteadiness of gait, slowness of muscular movements, hand tremors, hesitancy of speech, and cognitive impairment. And I put a picture in there of Muhammad Ali up at the top there. And then just an example that's not his brain, or could be, I don't know, uh, but uh, a picture of the substantia nigra. The bottom one says normal, obviously, and you can see the pigment. Uh, and then you can see basically no substantia nigra in the example above it uh, in that Parkinson's brain. And the surviving neurons in the substantia nigra containing an intracytoplasmic Louis body. Uh, a good picture of that in there as well. So pugilistic Parkinson's associate that with uh, boxers. Another famous person you might have heard of with Parkinson's disease is Michael J. Fox. Uh, he was an actor, author, advocate. Uh, Hollywood career had been marked by worldwide acclaim. So he was in many movies. Think Back to the Future. He was in TV shows. He was all over the place. Uh, and then he came down with Parkinsonism. So uh, what's it say here? Launched the foundation in 2000 after publicly disclosing his 1991 diagnosis at the age of 29 with Parkinson's disease. Uh, here's his website here. I read his book. His book is fascinating. Uh, basically, he had a horrendous hangover is what he was talking about uh, and that the hangover didn't go away. And of course, his doctors tell him that the hangover had uh, nothing to do with the Parkinsonism. But I'm also going to put it out there um, that throughout my career and throughout studying this, I've noticed that there happens to be a lot of addiction um, involved with Parkinsonism. So the idea that the person was addicted to something throughout their life or had an excessive lifestyle um, throughout their life. And then I anecdotally see a lot more Parkinson's associated with these patients. When I have Parkinson's patients and I and I pry a little bit further, I usually find out that they were an alcoholic and maybe have been in recovery for 20 years, or they were addicted to drugs, or they had an addictive personality seems to be this underlying theme, which makes sense to me because that dopamine is part of the reward system. So no research on this, but in my years of studying this and in treating patients and in my uh, years of, of liking this specialty and kind of reading up on it, I've noticed that um, I kind of put it in there as someone that's diabetic, type 2 diabetes, uh, that really just kind of beat up that system of insulin and insulin sensitivity, and then it kind of fatigues out. Do we have any proof of that whatsoever? No. Is it just a theme that I see over and over again and could I could be completely wrong? Yes. Just telling you uh, my thoughts here in studying this year after year. So check out his book. It's an interesting read. And then his uh, life's work in order to try and find a cure for it. So uh, you can kind of keep up to date on the process of it um, from his website here. Some classic signs and symptoms of Parkinsonism. It's going to be bradykinesia, masked face, fascinating gait, cogwheel rigidity, pill resting tremor. So bradykinesia is going to be slowness of movement. Brady is slow, tacky would be fast, remember. Brady is slow, kinesia is going to be movement. So slowness of movement. So we'll see a difficulty in starting or initiating a voluntary movement like eating, walking, writing. We'll see a fascinating gait associated with this as well. So they'll stand with their head and their shoulders stooped, that forward head posture, and they'll walk with these short shuffling steps. And uh, once they're, they start walking, these steps can get faster and faster, and the person might have a tough time stopping and might fall over. So I used to work in an Alzheimer's ward long before I ever became a chiropractor, and we had a patient there that had uh, Parkinsonism, pugilistic Parkinsonism. He was a boxer, and uh, I had patients uh, that had Parkinsonism, 
um, as a chiropractor, but you don't spend as much time as you do in the Alzheimer's ward with, with the patient. So it was eight hours a day, five days a week in that Alzheimer's ward. So uh, one of the things that I learned specifically was the uh, bradykinesia, the, the inability for that person to start walking, initiate walking. So you'd find him outside of his room in the hallway a lot of times uh, standing there. So he must have closed the door, stopped his forward uh, motion progress there, uh, and then he would kind of get stuck in gear again. And you'd see him kind of bouncing back and forth, looking like he's trying to rev up to walk and just can't initiate the movement. And so one of the nurses there taught us, I was a nurse's assistant, uh, taught us to go up to him, stand next to him uh, in the same posture that he's in. So you're kind of mirroring him and then create a beat and count and then show him what you want him to do. So it would look like this. I would clap and I would go one, two, three, and I'd walk and show him exactly what we, what we wanted to do. And then I would go back to right where we were before, right at where I was standing right next to him, and I would say, okay, now we're going to do this together, and he'd say, okay, and uh, I would do it again, and count and clap that one, two, three, and walk, and just like that, a lot of times he would be able to walk, so he, it was the initiation of the movement that he couldn't do, once he was going, he could walk, and it was like he caught that gear, and there he went. And so then I would just go about my day. I walked faster, and I was on my way somewhere else, so then I'd walk down. be like, okay, see you later, Mike. And he'd be like, thanks. And that was just commonplace. That's, that occurred time after time after time. And so uh, just teach the caretakers or their family members uh, a couple of tricks like that, and um, that, that was super helpful to be able to get him moving again, right? Uh, so that bradykinesia, that fascinating gait, this kind of cogwheel rigidity, kind of stuck in gear. Uh, the pill rolling resting tremor um, kind of looks like the, more like the money sign, right? So like if you were to kind of wiggle your thumb against your fingers, like a really bad snap or uh, that money symbol that you would maybe make, right? Uh, so on the next slide, there'll be some YouTube videos. Uh, there's a YouTube video underneath the cogwheel rigidity here that uh, I'd like for you to watch, but there's there's a bunch of videos um, that I'd like you to watch. Pill rolling tremor, fascinating gait, Parkinson's um, gait demonstrations, uh, and then um, one of a gentleman uh, riding a bike. So if you only have time for one, which I know how I know how things go, uh, watch the one riding the bike. It's fascinating. I can't play videos uh, in the PowerPoint here. I wish I could, and we could watch it together, but uh, I can't. So on the next slide, I'm gonna give you the YouTube videos, and uh, hope that you pause this recording of your PowerPoint and play those videos to get a better understanding of the. Uh, signs and symptoms of Parkinson's. So let's move to the next slide. Here are two great resources that I would like for you to watch. So the first one on the left there is what are the symptoms of Parkinson's disease? It is a nice video that kind of uh, brings you through everything that you need to know. And then the one on the right is from Michael J. Fox and his foundation and has the many faces of Parkinson's uh, disease. So um, some of the faces might surprise you on how young they are. Um, and every walk of life. So uh, give those two a watch, please. So pause your recording here and watch those two. And then I've got one more for you on the, on the next slide. This is the last video for Parkinson's. We have other videos for other diseases, but this is the last one for Parkinson's. If you watch only one video out of this entire presentation, uh, I would love for it to be this one. This is a minute and a half, and uh, this this video is so amazing to me that I don't even want to spoil it for you, so I'm not even going to talk about it. Just go ahead and pause and uh, take that next minute and a half and watch this video, and I'll meet you at the next slide. This is a cut and paste from the Michael J. Fox website talking about medication and therapy types. So I put the link in there so you could check it out if that is of interest to you. Uh, even if it's not of interest to you yet, one day you uh, will probably have a Parkinson's patient and you want to get the latest 
um, most up-to-date information. So that's where it's going to live. It changes so rapidly that it's better in website form than in a PowerPoint format. So I wanted to introduce this uh, concept to you this way. So uh, it's talking about for motor symptoms, for non-motor symptoms, deep brain stimulation, focused ultrasound, therapies and development. Those are all uh, subcategories and then you click on that and then it's going to uh, bring you to the latest information on that. So uh, go ahead and play around on there. Um, if neuro is of interest to you, it's uh, fascinating to me and I, I think it's interesting and important to stay up to date on the latest uh, technologies. Huntington's disease is caused by a mutation of what they call the Huntington gene because of Huntington's disease. So it is a repetition of the CAG gene sequence. It's an accumulation of this protein that's going to cause disease and it attacks the basal nucleus and other parts of the brain. We see cognitive and psychiatric symptoms such as depression, dementia, mood changes, repetitive involuntary movements. We see this elongated glutamine protein that's going to aggregate in the caudate and the putamen, which is going to cause neuronal death. This enlarges the lateral ventricles and it's expressed at about age 30 to 50. The more repeats, the younger the expression about 10 to 25 years before death. So usually that death is going to happen because of pneumonia from aspirating something due to the inability to swallow. So this, there's a video link here of this gentleman um, that's exhibiting Huntington's disease, uh, the classic Huntington's chorea. So chorea, think of the dance of Huntington's chorea, choreography, uh, same, word root there. So go ahead and pause and uh, watch this link to see the gate of Huntington's, please. And then go ahead and meet me at the next slide. Korea or choreography is where this word part comes from. Rapid irregular flow of motions. Think of it like a dance. It's the dance of Huntington's is what it's usually called. We'll see this kind of piano playing flexion and extension of the fingers elevation and depression of shoulders and hips, crossing and uncrossing of the legs, and grimacing movements of the face. Athetosis is a slow writhing movement of the hand, kind of this war extremities in general. So worm-like movements of the trunk and extremities, and we often see it with cerebral palsy. Dystonia or dysfunctional tone. So we'll see this as a postural and movement disorder in a fixed position of the trunk and limbs. And that brings us to the end of our chapter on the basal nucleus. So we went through the structures, some of the basic functions, and some of the disease processes that are well known uh, to be associated with the basal nucleus. Go ahead and check out your quizzes on your web page uh, for school there, and uh, I will meet you at the next chapter.